we looked at hundreds of historical um, deals and and then mapped them through to to what closed and looked at what were the real indicators in a, in a deal that things were going to 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 close and it was always Today, we are joined by Toby Carrington, Chief Business Officer at Seismic. Our conversation of today is about fitting better today's buyer expectation. Because as you will see, Toby touches on the concept of aligning sales processes with buyer behavior rather than pushing a predetermined sales agenda. And so, to that regard, there are three key takeaways for you to look forward to. First, we'll unpack how B2B buyer expectations have changed and what this means for selling today. Next, Toby will let us in on how we can speed up sales cycles effectively. And lastly, we'll dive into how AI is shaping not just the way we sell, but also how buyers make their decisions, making everything quicker and smarter. So please enjoy my conversation with Toby. Hey there, are you letting your marketing and sales teams leverage the power of deep data? If not, you may want to check out Dealfront. It is Europe's leading go-to-market platform. And Dealfront draws from three channels of data, EU company databases, multilingual web crawling, and trigger event. And so this allows you to identify accounts exhibiting genuine buying intent, pinpoint key decision maker, access their contact details, and seamlessly integrate with your CRM for streamlined operations. With deep data comes a deep understanding of how to reach your revenue potential. Oh, and have I mentioned that Dealfront was born and raised in Europe? Therefore, no need to worry about data compliance. They know all about it. Learn more about Dealfront at wearesales.com slash Dealfront. Again, that's wearesales.com slash Dealfront. Well, Toby, I'm super excited to have you on. Not only, um, not only because I love to sit down with people that are in the sales tech scene, but also because Seismic has undergone its own transformation recently, uh, or at least the sales process did, right? Because uh, to quote yourself, buyer expectation in, B- in B2B has changed. Um, and that had some consequences on the way that you guys approach things. But before I get ahead of myself, can you maybe introduce yourself? Also feel free to introduce Seismic and also your role as Chief Business Officer. Thanks, Dylan. Yeah, great to great to be with you. Um, yeah, so Toby Carrington, uh, I'm Australian, as you can probably tell by my by my accent, but I'm based here in based here in Austin, Texas. I've been in the United States for about nine years. Uh, I've been at Seismic for just over four years now. Um, I joined actually running revenue operations and progressed up to to being our chief business officer. And, and in that role, I run uh, operations and strategy for the for the company, reporting to us reporting to our CEO. All right. And so, what what made you join Seismic? How how is what was the link with you and Seismic? Actually, I was a customer before. I used to run uh, sales operations and enablement for Siemens Seltenius, the the medtech uh, company, as part of the the Siemens portfolio. That probably listeners there in in, in Europe at least are, are well familiar with. And I was a customer of Seismic, and actually, we use Seismic to power the transformation of sort of digital transformation that was happening in sales and marketing at that. Um, at that time, and a lot of it was about, you know, empowering that customer-facing organization with uh, content, tools, insights uh, that they needed to sort of grow the grow the business. There, we were doing a digital digital transformation. So through that, I got to know the, the team at Seismic very well, and ultimately ended up ended up joining so that I could work with a lot of other organizations that they were undergoing similar similar transformations in their in their journey. Yeah. A lot about you know, the last few years, the few years, with the shift away from in office and the changes that happened in COVID and so forth, you know, the enablement and the rise of, of platforms to help with with you know what to know, what to say, what to show, what to do type type things, also in a virtual setting, sort of really took off. Mm-hmm. Yeah, because before we go more into that, I want I still want to kind of understand like the context that you are most familiar with, most comfortable talking about, because. Yeah. What were your roles predominantly before joining Seismic? And then also when you joined Seismic, what, what were you hired for uh, in the first place? Because I, if I'm not mistaken, I think it was uh, very much into revenue operations. And so I think that's that's, right. that might also be a good uh, uh, information for the, the conversation ahead. Yeah, that's that's right, Dylan. So when I joined Seismic, I mean, just by context, we just sort of crossed, crossed the $100 million revenue mark and we were we were scaling. So the whole topic was 
how to create an engine within the revenue organization that was repeatable, scalable, that was applicable not just to the United States and some of the verticals that we'd been more traditionally strong in, like for example, financial services. And you know, there was there was expansion going on in in Europe, there was expansion going on in, in Asia. And so that scale and repeatability was had had a number of different dimensions. So I I joined, you know, I've worked in many different countries in different uh, different roles building you know, building out that sort of engine across let's call it processes tools data and and people to help to, to help to grow that and so that's the context in which I in which I joined then then over time over the last few years as we've grown seismic as a business you know that that function has also grown and, and expanded within within seismic to take on you know company-wide operational topics not just not just for the revenue organization Good. Yeah, because how? what's the uh, the revenue context at Seismic when you have to describe like the revenue organization, go-to-market motions, you know, anything? Uh, yeah, that kind of describe the, the, the sales context. Yeah. So, I mean, we're, a, we're now about, you know, three, three and a half times when I, when I, when I joined. So sort of mid, mid 300s type um, revenue business, we, we work with very, very large organizations, right? So, um, the largest enterprise companies in the in the world, as well as you know, very small SMB mid market type organizations, because we work with anyone that's on a on a process of improving their their go to market productivity, their their customer facing organizations, productivity, efficiency, and so forth. And you know, in some cases, that can that can be they're looking to just improve the skills of a 20, 20 person you know, selling team. In other cases, it's tens of thousands of everyone in a customer facing org that needs to get on the get on the same page, be aligned, you know, working off the same playbook and and so forth. So we do span, you know, very small customers to very large, you know, the largest companies in the in the world are are our are our customers. Um the the sales force now, you know, when I joined it was you know, we didn't have the the same geographic reach, but the sales force now is, you know, we're talking about Seven or eight hundred sort of go to market people across Europe, Asia, and and the United States uh, in different in different segments. So that's that's sort of the, the size and scale that we're we're talking about. And you know, again, that's that's grown substantially, of course, in that period of time that I that I joined. I mean, I think the number of people that we're talking about is um, is is at least double, and you know, the revenue is three to three and a half times what it was when I joined. That's uh, yeah. That says another about the transformation you have to undergo. <laughs> well, I think it's also as we as we get as we get more as you get more efficient, right? I mean, obviously, there's a certain four years ago in in software sales, uh, the expectations were different around growth than they maybe are than they maybe are now. You know, obviously, we became a you know we moved from Series D to a much later stage startup uh, company. So you know, I've seen a lot of different. You know, those different uh, different phases. <laughs> yeah, that's that's interesting because I would say there is a change of expectation, not really so much on performance, but maybe on the way that you get there. Would you agree? That's right, and I think as you, as you said in the introduction, a lot of that's to do with the buyer buyer expectations are changing and have changed. And I mean, I think for software companies, particularly software companies serving go to market teams, there's been a transformation like we've never seen before with with COVID and the the change that that brought into into the way that people buy and that they expect to be let's say to be sold to and by selling I also mean you know interacted to with post sales or any sort of you know the ongoing the ongoing relationship and the, the fact is that now I mean we don't need to spend too much time talking about how much research people do online how much of the buying journey is done without a person. How much of the the expectation they have when they have a whether it be the first outreach or whether it be you know a customer that you've had for many years they expect a much different quality of interaction they expect a much more personalized much more relevant much more contextual much more data driven approach to what they need and they need to get to the point quickly and and so you know we we obviously sell a product that assists that happening but we therefore also have to be best practice at delivering that type of <laughs> that type of buying experience so you know i think there's there's an added pressure which comes with 
which comes with that at, at Seismic because you know, my team oversees the use of our own technology as well as other technologies in the marketplace. And so we have to make that work as best as we can. Exactly. You know, that's the exact reason why I love having this conversation, Toby, because you indeed have to be first in class. You have to be the role model. You have to go and make the failures before anyone else. And so <laughs> yes, maybe to, to kickstart this conversation. So yeah, you, you mentioned there is a change in B2B expectation, much more information upfront, uh, self-serve. It also needs to be contextual for the different personas, especially also well, the context of seismic is rather, I would say, complex sales. So you have those uh, complex decision-making units um, and information needs to flow from the selling organization to the buying organization in an efficient way, but also effective way. So, I mean, start wherever you want to start, but what would be for you best practice when it comes to that entering 2024? So I think a lot of that's got to be contextual you know some of the people listening will work at a smaller will work at a smaller company some will work at a at a larger company and i think that for everyone first of all understanding what journey their buyers go through and i don't buy a buyer's journey i really don't mean any of those things we used to see in textbooks about here's where you start and you follow these steps and you get to the end because everybody hopefully knows by now that's nonsense and your buyer the buyer's journey goes all over the all that goes all over the place. It's about understanding what buyers do um, in a particular stage in the context of your your business, and using a simple using a simple example of how that translates to some of the tra the transformation we had to do, but that also I I always give as advice to to others is start with how buyers are buying first and what they do first as it relates to the process that you create because we've we've been taught historically in you know sales operations sales leadership and so forth a lot of the the processes that we come up with are inside out and they don't they're not based on the actions that a buyer takes you know do they do they at a certain point in time involve as you say multiple complex stakeholders or are there always you know steps that we you didn't think about before that they have to follow with IT or infosec or, or, or things like that. I think you have to then reshape your internal process, know where a deal is at, to know where something is at and therefore what to do based on what uh, a customer is is doing. I use the most simple example just to just to illustrate, Dylan, is um, sales stages, right? I mean, yeah. everybody has stages in the in whichever CRM system they're using to say, okay, this opportunity is moving from stage two to stage three to stage four to, you know, where, where wherever. And for example, generating a generating a quotation, delivering a quote to a customer. Okay. It, just because you sent a quote to a customer or a or a prospect doesn't doesn't mean anything. Doesn't mean that the stage moved. But did they ask for the quote? Did they engage with the quote? Did they send the quote to to finance? Those things uh, are indications of the the buying journey moving along. Just you internally sending a quote out isn't isn't an indication that the deal has actually has actually moved along. So I think it's about subtly reshaping your processes to be based on what the buyer is is doing or the potential buyer is doing, not what you internally are. Are doing so how would you advise any sales leader to approach this and maybe you can bring in the experience that you have at, at yeah. seismic um feel free to also kind of give like a little bit more of context because i know in the preparation you, you 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 mentioned that sales cycle was able to reduce by a lot because one of the steps in that sales process with the different stages was actually taken off or reduced somehow um, and so I think that maybe by explaining that experience particularly, you can also bring in some some advice on how anyone could actually approach that. Yeah, absolutely. So some of the the things that we looked at, I mean, you know, if you're any, anyone who works in operations and hopefully in sales leadership, you know, there's there's certain KPIs that you want to focus on, like shortening deal velocity, um, improving win rates, improving deal sizes and things like that. And those are things that an operations team needs to needs to think about. So when we sat down and we were looking at, okay, how do we how do we do those specific specific things? One of the, the big things was 
uh, cl- clarifying those exit criteria, Dylan, from from stage to stage, and really looking at what were the the true indicators. Um, you know, we looked at we looked at hundreds of historical um, deals and and then mapped them through to to what closed and looked at what were the real indicators in a in a deal that things were going to 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 close. And it was always based on what the buyer did, not what on not on what we not on what we did. And then you need to work backwards, right? And you need to determine what are the activities that you need to you need to go through to make sure you give yourself the best chance of those things those things occurring. So you know, for us, that was, as I said, changing the exit criteria to being things that were buyer centric based on what the buyer, the buyer did, and then making sure we created specific playbooks to make sure that our sellers did those things. So we, we made very, very specific sort of pairing in our playbooks of if a buyer does this, you should do that, you know, and I think that's what a lot of that creating that a type of playbook is where you get the the change management. It's where you get the repeatability. It's where you get the scale across your your sales process, right? If you go from enabling, you know, a hundred people to enabling seven hundred people, you can't do that by word of mouth or best practice sharing or anything like that. You need to have playbooks. And for us, that was getting down to as granular as, okay, this particular buyer engaged with this particular type of content. Here's the actions that that we recommend you you take and that was you know based off of data and based off the you know their our, our learnings for what the what the best practice what the best practice was and that that was able to get things you know unstuck at many many different stages it's of course it's a constant it's a constant thing that that goes on you never get it right for every every deal but of course you need plays for specific things like you know you, you can then create a play like what we did we created some plays for if things were stuck or in a particular bail stage for for a couple of couple of weeks for example more than normal we said okay here's here's the plays that you should run here's here's the specific type of content here's the here's the talk track that you could use here's the specific things that you could you could do and you know everybody has some form of playbook but i would question about how much of that is really um driven based off the activities that you need to that you need to undertake um based on what the buyer is doing as opposed to just doing things that you think make sense from a from a sales process standpoint right hi there are you identifying anonymous companies visiting your website and automatically sending them to your crm for sales team to convert If not, you may want to check out Dealfront. It is Europe's leading go-to-market platform. With Dealfront, you can discover exactly what your website visitors are looking for and engage with the right leads at the right time with a message that captures their interest. By the way, they are already serving more than 10,000 clients across 27 European countries. To learn more about Dealfront, go at wearesales.com slash Dealfront. Again, wearesales.com slash Dealfront. And now, back to the episode. Yeah, because to make it even more tangible, especially if you've analyzed, you know, more than a hundred deals um, and really looked at what were the true indicators, like, well, what are typical, yeah, buying behavior, I mean, buyer's behavior that actually moved the deal forward to just, yeah, give an idea to the listeners of, yeah, maybe you have to look at those types of actions um, and yeah, focus on those instead of what the sales people and sales team need to do. Yeah, absolutely. So, I mean, there's a few that we captured via data, and then there's a few that I also have as sort of other soft indicators, let's say, that we use when we're inspecting um, inspecting some deals, Dylan. So, you know, uh, the the big one is the buying committee um, for us that we saw that when, you know, so in our in our deals, typically there are more than six people involved in a buying committee. And now that doesn't mean that they all are deciding on things, right? But, you know, we we sell to an enablement manager or enablement leader who may work for a, an operations um, leader or they may work for a chief revenue officer. They also partner with, um, with marketing typically and then maybe there's people from finance or things like that um, involved. But, you know, single-threaded versus multi-threaded and I know that's probably common sense to most people, but people get very excited and very happy when they talk to someone who loves their their solution. But 
we found over the over the last few years, especially with people changing companies a lot and things like that, often people don't know how to to buy um, within their own organi- organization. And so we we found a clear indicator that of being multi-threaded. The more people that are involved in a in a deal, not only helps the deal to to close because you're talking to the right people, but also go faster because that collective group of people that are involved understand more, um, you know, more of what's going on. The other one related to that is the title and level of, of people. So especially in the last year or so with economic conditions changing and things like that, the the CFO is often involved or at least someone from the finance team. So an indicator of a deal progressing is, you know, finance or the FP&A team or someone like that um, being involved in a, in a deal. Sometimes that can be procurement on behalf of that, but those types of roles not being involved or not not engaging at a, at a obviously at a later point in time in the in the deal cycle, but not engaging is a is an indicator of um, of of that. Now we also started looking very very specifically at the activities that were driving some of those behaviors, like people getting engaging with 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 content, you know, different people engaging and and so on and so on and so forth. And so, uh, where I'm still a believer that it's important to look at the the activity and engagement level um, from prospects and from and from buyers. I mean, obviously, it should seem pretty logical that if if a buyer or buying team is not having meetings with you, reading emails, having calls, that things can can go away. But there's been a little bit of a trend recently where people are saying, "Don't measure any activity. You should, you know, don't don't worry about activity." And there's other things to to focus on that that's old school and so forth. But, you know, my view is that there are pretty clear activities that, that we drill down on and maybe getting a little bit more in depth than just calls and, and emails. It's about, for us, it's about engagement, engaging in, in content. It's about whether or not, um, you know, that content's been shared with other people and, and things like that. But we are still tracking some of those, let's call it basic, basic activities to determine engagement levels on, you know, with our with our accounts as, as well. Now, I would say, you know, having been involved in hundreds and hundreds of of cycles myself, from small companies to large larger companies, there's other things that we we look for very clearly to determine whether we think this is a real deal. The, the first one is that we get executive access. Um, that if a, if someone from our sales team or our customer success team wants to invite our our CEO or myself or our, our president chief revenue officer, for example, to to meetings that there is a willing participant on the other side because that indicates that what we're selling is something of sort of business priority, strategic nature to what's to what's going on. Where we've had success historically is where we're part of broader change initiatives, broader broader strategic initiatives, not just you know not just something that's down down at a at a, at a lower level. So. That's that's one indicator, and I love the classic one, which is: uh, Are you on a text messaging basis or not with um, with people at the, <laughs> at the at the customer? You know, that's that's evolved with things like Slack and 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 Teams and so forth, where people can also put you on channels and things like that. It used to be it used to be dealing like, did they give you a badge to go into their office? You know what I mean? Like, right. To, 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 it used to be that kind of thing. The the modern day equivalent is: Are you on the group chat? Are you on their Slack channel? Are you on those those things? And and I, you know, we of course we don't measure that last piece, but that's something that we actually ask and we we inspect around the closeness of relationships as well. People still buy from that people. That is very in true. The end. Yeah. In the end, it is. No, that's 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 very true. I, I like that one as well. No, and and. I mean, to, to circle back to what you said, I think my very first pipeline management course that I followed was also about, there are certain elements that you give as a salesperson, but I mean, by far, what's most important is what you get back from the the customers, the prospect in terms of information, in terms of, yeah, whatever, whatever can be precious to, uh, to having clarity about the buying process on itself. So on that, I, I totally get you. And then on the other hand, I also see, I mean, because what you get directly from the customers or the prospects is what they are able to communicate directly to you. But then you also have what they are doing in absence of you. Like you said, 
they go on your website, there is that that engagement somehow with whatever you have to offer, whatever you you're yeah you're putting out to the world. So I think that those two indeed are a great element. And then as you said, yeah, the more you are uh, in contact with the executive or inside the organization already, I think it's a clear indication of uh, of a, of a deal moving forward. It's about what people do, Dylan. Like you know, like people can say anything, and actually, people like to, you know, of course, people don't like necessarily like conflict or things like that. They they often are interested in in something, but to determine whether a deal is going to move forward, do they involve executives? Do they involve the other stakeholders? Do they regularly go back and look and, and engage with the, the the things that you're doing? Because you know, many people will will look at a you know technology. They'll take it. They'll take a demo and they'll say, "Oh, that's interesting. That could be interesting." And people get happy happy years. We 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 call it here. I mean, sellers or people trying to to you know, manage accounts get get happy years. And it's a really about what they do and what they do with the, the the information that you're you're sharing. What they do with the buying committee. What they do in terms of access. How they how they in, in, interact. Um, you know, people are not deliberately wasting time of of course but sometimes people are happy to let things go along and that's why deals stall because people keep saying the right things they they sellers have been taught to okay get the next meeting on the books get a get a follow-up call and then you know what happens is someone you know i buy a lot of software right i buy all about software here and there's some companies that i like the people i like what they're selling but i'm and i'm having a regular call with them but it's really just a check-in call there's nothing new i'm not doing that much in the in the background whereas you know and and the ones that that have successfully sold to us they know that when i'm involving certain people when i'm asking people from my team to engage when i'm involving you know sales leadership and so forth those are the things that that mean that something is progressing all right yeah no the 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 thing i wanted to come uh, come back on is the mention that the playbooks that you are introducing now have switched from a sales rep does something in with expectation that the buyer will react on it somehow, right? Activities driving certain buy behavior. Where now you said, let's reverse that and you only have certain sales actions when the buyer has performed something um, and really tailor the playbooks towards that direction. Are you then only looking at it that way or do you say you also leave some flexibility for the other way around where it's also the sales rep that needs to yeah move the buyer to a certain direction and that might yeah create some action and then the sales rep takes a third on it yeah look absolutely i mean you can't we're not saying that sellers should stop trying to sell i mean some deals are are definitely done with assistance and you know creating a need and and sellers doing certain things uh, as well right so of course we've got tactics and i suppose that's probably more on the pipeline creation demand creation earlier on in the in the sales cycle where of course we are we are still you know selling right i mean we're doing a lot of outbound work creating demand and and trying to trying to to do that i guess what i'm talking about is uh, throughout our making sure our discovery process is much is much stronger as we're as we're doing that, qualifying deals out of our pipeline quickly so that we're not wasting we're not wasting time and things like that based on what the buyer is doing. So of course we 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 have a lot of things which are you know again at the top of the funnel which are sales sales driven motion that we're trying to do to create create demand. I mean enablement is not in all markets around the world it's not universally understood right i mean i think here in the united states it's it's more um advanced europe uh, you know there of course there's some some european based um enablement companies as as well that have that have um helped to to develop the the market there and you know where i'm from down in down in the sort of Asia Pacific region, you know, enablement can be understood differently. So there's still, of course, education that's going on in the market. There's um, the nuances of the sort of different, you know, geographies and, and geopolitical type type things that that make a difference. So no, we're leaving that flex the, that flexibility. But what we have found that make successful customers, Dylan, is very clearly there are strategic things that are 
that a buyer is trying to to do. They are trying to you know improve their productivity. They're trying to improve the effectiveness. They're trying to reduce the the ramp time. They're trying to move from mid market to enterprise accounts. Whatever whatever they're trying to whatever they're trying to to do, and you know we need to provide value along those those dimensions. So typically, they have some clue now that you know that now that the the market's a little bit more educated they have some clue about who they can partner with to do those to do those things you know there's a lot of if you if you view if you look at the sales tech landscape and it's well documented about you know how many thousand of those companies there there are that can help in some way shape or form with revenue optimization there is overlapping functionality between between platforms and and tools and and things like that, it's not really about that. It's about what's the use case of a particular buyer. What are they trying to do, and how can they best how can they best solve that? So, you know, we can educate them, and we run proactive plays, of course, to explain why our solution is right for them. But based on what they do, and based on our read of that situation, we should also quickly qualify deals out. If they're not um, if they're not suitable, and that's something that we've had to, you know, get used to as we get bigger and as we scale, is saying no. Uh, you know, we typically when we were when we were a smaller company, and I know a lot of smaller companies out there. I work with some really early companies. They're happy to work any lead, any lead, any opportunity, any opportunity that they that they think is closely qualified. But again, we're using what buyers do to make sure that we're working on the right deals as well. I think that's for sure the main key lesson of, uh, of this conversation, Toby, what main buyers do. Um, I also want to introduce the, the the topic of discovery and the demo being split up. Because I mm-hmm. recall from the preparation that that is something that as I speak, you initially did. But then if I'm yep. not mistaken, you retransformed that. Can you maybe share that story? Yeah, so if you... What we had was, I think, a pretty typical approach for you know software companies like like us, which was we get we do some sort of out you know cold calling process or inbound you know they come inbound on our on our website you know request a demo, but then our first call would be discovery, saying tell me about your business pros, tell me about what you're trying to do, and and so on and so on and so forth. But that and then. You know, and that was done by a you know business development person, and then it would be handed over to you know a sales team and, and sales engineer. Now, that has changed as buyer expectations have changed because they 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 know what they want to they want to do. They expect that we know something about their industry that we can offer a perspective, and they want to get to the point because they've already researched, uh, you know, the company. They've researched the space. They they understand why they're why they're talking to us generally um you know they've looked up the buyer on LinkedIn. they've looked up the seller excuse me on linkedin they've they've done a bunch of things they they you know they've looked at youtube videos whatever the case may be they're more educated so we just found we were wasting um we we're wasting people's time we were leading to, to frustration so um we haven't totally replaced the doing a demo and doing doing discovery but discovery for us is not like a first call anymore you know every call has discovery every touch point even when we're right at the end about to to sign we're making sure that we're we're still on we're still on track we're reconfirming all of those things so sort of discovery is is put throughout our um entire entire process even when they become a customer we we think we're continuously doing discovery continuously checking back on the objectives that we thought they were trying to achieve at the start. What value? What outcomes are they now? They now delivering. But we got much quicker to the point. So we we've enabled our 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 BDR team to do you know the sort of the forty thousand foot demo up front, and then use that as discovery to be able to determine okay which of the areas resonated the most. So now let's have a sales engineer come in and and dive down to the next level of detail. And again, I can tell you as someone who buys a lot of software, if I get on a call and people say, okay, so tell me about Seismic and tell me about your challenges and I sit there answering, being interrogated for half an hour, that, that adds no value. That adds no value to me. So I want to get, you know, I want to get to some of the value quickly. Mm. Yeah, I think that's a, I think that's a good one. Now, 
you being someone that is is a simple example sorry to to jump in i mean go ahead, there's go a ahead. rise of self self service demo uh right now right so that's one of the latest sales tech sort of booms and you know i think that's i think that's great and that's another example of how buyers themselves want to compress the period of time that they're actually talking to people and seeing things because a demo always looks fantastic uh you know when you when you when you see it done and, and in a nice clean environment and so forth but self-service demo you know and, and demo automation is also accelerating the ability to like look at your own data in a in a sort of demo environment or look at certain snippets or do it do it yourself without needing to to sit through a, a, a demo so i think those early stages of a of a cycle people really need to to look at if you've still got a very traditional very linear approach to that you can definitely condense that and, and buyers do want to condense that yeah and i think i mean if i look at myself as a buyer that's also what i would like to see if i if i enter in in a conversation with with a vendor i want to i want to see it i want to feel it for myself as quick as possible in order to make a decision if it's worth the time to move forward or not. That's right. And the, the same things are around like um, <clears throat> pricing, for, for for example, or now, you know, in, as I said, we sell from small companies to, 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 large, to large companies now. So pricing for us is not something that you can just get on a website or, or so forth. But we also want to get quickly to the value that people are going to to get from our solution and then how much is it going to cost because that's also a way to you know you want to be transparent with people you also don't want to waste six months and then realize oh the customer has no no budget either but you know you know as a buyer if you go on to amazon you know you don't have to click 27 times to get the price you know the you know the price uh, up front and people want that type of um sort of experience that they have in their own personal lives in in b2b interactions now it's not as simple when you're talking about enterprise software as just to say here's the price but for many for many software companies it is so if you can have that transparency as quickly as as possible on things like pricing you 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 should do um because it's it's the same you know the type of frustration that you would that occurs in a buying process if People just want to know how much it is to move forward. Then you know they they should at least be able to get a to get a to get a pretty good order of magnitude. Yeah, I'm happy you brought it up because I I feel like pricing is such a I don't want to say sensitive topic, but like on the one hand, it is something that you don't want to share too quickly because you have to build up value. On the other, if Thanks. you have to look indeed from a buyer perspective. The buyer wants to know that as quickly as possible. So it's like you said, it, it's it's a bit of finding a balance in between, I mean, in between, yeah, sharing it but building up value first. Like, so how do how, how are you guys approaching that actually? If if I, yeah. for example, uh, buyer X, yeah, just want to go quickly to the price, are you saying no? Let's build up value first with the demo and everything. Or yeah, how do you go and how do you go about it? So. You know, I'll give you an it depends uh, example here, Dylan. I mean, there's a diff there's a different thing between a you know twenty twenty person a company that's looking for sort of our you know our, our, our training and training and coaching solution. I mean, we we of course have a have pricing pricing tiers and things like that that can be it can be can be shared for that. Where you're talking about you know a combination of, of products, things that are maybe non standard and so forth. Of course, we spend. We spend more time understanding understanding that we have a value consulting team, but the biggest part of value is for me not creating a business case to help get a deal signed off. Our value consulting team, and what what I would encourage people to think about when they're doing this, when you're creating value, you have to be able to deliver that, and you have to be able to measure that throughout the life cycle of working with a with a customer, and you have to constantly go back and agree to those to those things because if I sell you seismic the value you get out of seismic is not just based on what i deliver to you it's how you use it how you you know how you adopt change whether your leadership is bought into the the new way you're going to work with the platform so it's always a partnership right so those delivering the values are always a partnership so we try to agree on that up front not so much to, to set a price but to 
a tool to set the way of mutual understanding of the the valuable outcomes that we're going to to deliver you know together obviously from there you can you can derive a, a price and uh you know then then present that but we always you know try to start with what are people trying to do what are the outcomes that they're trying to you know to to get to but you know of course pricing is a is a topic where you need to be very careful and have a structure which is based on you know similar size similar size customers similar type of scope because of course people move around they change companies companies get bought and sold and you know for me the big thing in pricing is you can always pass a what I call a rent face test, right? Like if I sold to you at one company and then you went to go to another company and the the pricing is half the price and you can't explain why, then you know that's that's on the credibility of the the organization. And I think a lot of companies, software companies especially, have gone through a maturity where when they were young they didn't necessarily have a pricing strategy. They were just happy to have customers at kind of whatever price. But as you grow and mature, there needs to of course be a be some structure be behind it. But I would say whenever you've aligned on the outcomes that you're trying to to achieve, quickly try to get to the scope of what you're you're trying to do. I mean, you know, clarifying whether a customer or a buyer has budget and if if they're willing to share that they have budget again to the topic of what do buyers do. Of course, you know, at that point in time you need to you need to be talking price. Yeah, exactly. Hi guys, on May 16, 2024, we are hosting the third edition of the We Are Sales Conference. This is the event in Europe when it comes to sales leadership. Our ambition is to eventually get to the 10,000 attendees, so it will mean the world to us to see you there. You can get more information about the event on our website at wearesales.com slash conference. All right, let's go back. I also want to talk about um, AI. I mean, it's not, it's not new by now. Uh, but I know that you guys are in the trenches, so yeah, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm pretty sure that you guys are investing a lot in the capabilities of it. But I'm, uh, I mean, less interested in what it can mean for the salespeople. I'm actually very interested, and I don't know if you have anything on it, uh, what it could actually mean for the buyers. Like, how will they leverage the power of generative AI in the way that they will buy tomorrow, and how can we then, as salespeople, Kind of anticipate on that. Well, I think there's a few. I think there's a few things there. Well, the first one is just the speed at which they can do their independent research on on things is going to be massively enhanced. We've already talked about how much people do sort of on the internet by themselves, you know, peer sites and and things like that. That'll be that'll be drastically, you know, drastically drast, drastically improved. I think that the ability for things like self-service demos and things like that will will improve but i've also seen for example um things that i think will be pretty real pretty soon like procurement uh assistance ai um uh, assisted procurement for example where you'll have i'll have all the knowledge of okay here's the types of things we can agree in contracts and things that we can't agree in contracts and that whole back and forth of contract redlining and pricing negotiation and, and what's a fair price that'll be ai assisted by the seller and also by the by the buyer you know when you feed these these llms with with large data sets of here's typical discount um rates here's here's typical conditions that we agree on and you'll you'll have that that process be be done uh you know quickly i think it's just going to put more and more and more pressure on the ability of a seller to show that they can do something personal and relevant um, as well, Dylan, in the the way that they prepare for a meeting, the way that they deliver um, content in a in a meeting, or that they interact during during meetings, the way that they follow up, because people are going to expect that to happen very very quickly, right? I mean, you have um, you have the ability for AI to and then there's some of the things you know you talked about like what we're doing in our in our product for example to you know recommend things that we should talk about recommend create an agenda recommend the content even in a live situation as we're talking depending on what's being said to surface content 
straight away in the in the moment that can be shared to immediately follow up after a meeting with with summaries and actions and things like things like that. So I think that expectations are just going to go through the roof. If I have a call with you, and then I say, okay, so tell me about your company and tell me what you're doing. I mean, of course, that that you're not going to pay any attention to that uh, anymore because it's even simpler to do from a from a sales person's point of view. So I think that you know any seller, any customer facing person who's not getting very fluent with how AI can help them in the research phase, how it can help with preparation or, you know, for, for interactions, the in interaction, follow up from interactions and, and so forth. And working, you know, they should be encouraging their their um, companies internally, their operations people, IT departments and so forth to to work with vendors that are investing heavily in in AI because you know, they're, if they're if they're not going to do that, I think they'll they'll fall behind. So I think that you know, sellers are, sellers need to be very careful about which organisations they go and work for to make sure they've got those tools. Because I think that that sort of it's going to go on. It's going to go on in a, at hyper speed. The expectation of of a of a highly relevant interaction powered by AI sort of insights. Yeah, I, I think you said it there. I think it's going to be hyper speed, or at least that's my assumption my hypothesis is that everything from collection of information analysis of information making of decisions i think everything will be so so impressively quick in the coming quick. years and it's yeah and i'm still i find it very hard for myself to to kind of uh yeah, get a grasp on it of how it will become i mean obviously that makes sense but uh yeah. Any let last me, thought on, use on a, that topic? Yeah, let me use a funny analogy. And I, so I, you know, it's we've just it's starting the new year and so forth. A lot of end of year catch ups with people recently and things like that. And <laughs> when I, I I caught up with um, a friend and and a business associate of mine who's who's invested a lot in this sort of AI for for sales. His name's um, Jake Jake Dunlap. He's CEO of a company called Scaled. Anyway, we caught up recently for breakfast and we were in in he's, he's in, in Austin we were in a local let's call it a diner it's it's close enough to a to a diner and you know of course traditional American diner style is a lovely server there asking for like coffee asking what we want to have for for breakfast and so forth took our order and then she left and then a few minutes later a robot turned up with our food right and gave us the food and we were both kind of dumbfounded because we didn't have any expectation of technology having any role in our breakfast, especially not in, let's say this was not the type of, you know, restaurant that we thought would have this type of technology. And we thought about it. We looked at it. It was we, not the McDonald's. Of course, because <laughs> not, was, it, it, no. And we were, and we were, we were both amazed that this robot turned up and gave us the food and gave us in the, in the right way. And it wasn't a gimmick, you know, historically these things have been a gimmick. And I think the same has been true with AI and things like that. Previously, it's been a little bit of a maybe a gimmick in in some way, and hasn't realised the real productivity. But when we when we saw that and we looked around, we realised okay, there was one server in this entire restaurant, but then with the robot, uh, she could take care of the whole restaurant and and was was more productive. And we also had a better experience. We didn't need to talk to 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 her the whole time. Now, I wouldn't have wanted to speak to the robot. The entire time because there was some you know he wanted some hot sauce and we wanted some extra salt and whatever and so she came back and checked on it but she was really really using technology to her advantage we had a better we had a better experience it was more efficient and you know that that restaurant needed half as many people the same is going to be true in b2b sales the, the same is going to be true people still want to interact with a the person there's nothing more infuriating than calling a you know, hotline or using a chat service that just goes around and around and around in circles and you can't get what you you can't get what you want. Those things will improve. When you want to talk to a human, you should talk to a human. But when not, people are going to have the ability to resolve their problems, to buy, to get whatever information. They're going to have that ability through through AI. And so that's I think the way we have to think about it and the way that people have to look at their processes is still how how do people buy, but how will they buy and which steps could be enhanced with with generative AI? It should not be just the conversation of we can replace fifty percent of our salespeople with generative AI. That doesn't make that doesn't make sense. You should start with again, how do people buy? What are they trying to do? And which of those steps can you use generative AI? 
which vendors can you work with that are helping you with those those steps and then you know what are the outcomes that you're looking to to get out of that in terms of you know buyer satisfaction productivity etc cetera, etc cetera. i think those are good reflection questions for uh, for the listeners though we thank you so much for coming on the show um is there a way that you want to use this platform maybe doing a call to action uh some way i mean i don't know of course, Salesmake is relevant for the for the audience, so maybe you can do a call to action towards that, but maybe you're also hiring for any roles in the region. So I don't know. Is there any way you want to use this platform for? Uh, no, no, I mean not not necessarily. But, I mean, I think, you know, I don't want to do a commercial for for Seismic here, Dylan. <laughs> I think that that overall in general, thinking about operations and enablement as strategic functions <laughs> in your in your organization, that as people think about scaling as they think about the change management that's going to occur, especially with AI and these changing expectations, people should really look holistically at their at their business. They should look at the the processes that they want uh, followed based on what you know the what their clients are, are doing. They should look at the relevant data insights that they need to that they need to focus on because we've had we have more data than ever before. It's about which which of the right which is the right data to to focus on in their in their process. They should look at the tooling very, very carefully. And this is where of course we 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 are working with, you know, an ecosystem. There's not one tool or platform to rule at all. Anyone who tells you that they have the software platform that does everything is not is not a is not credible. But you should look at how does how do people's platforms engage with the main other tools that you use? How do they partner? What's the the depth of integration and so forth? And then you should look at the people. And you know all sales leaders um, out there should should understand that is the, the the pace of change, the the way that sellers are going to have to you know differentiate them themselves in in the future is going to be is going to be faster than ever before. So you know embrace things like um, generative AI and don't put restrictive policies in place to to re, to restrict that. Make sure that you're actually encouraging people to do that within the realms of you know, appropriate tests about, you know, competitiveness and, and quality and, and things like things like that. But make sure that you're actually encouraging encouraging that sort of technology enabled change in your in your go to market organizations. Love it. Thy buyer behavior to success. It's not the tool, it's the utilization of the tool and embrace quick change. I think that uh, kind of sums it all up. That's it. Thank you, Dylan. Toby, thank you so much. Wishing you nothing but the best and see you next time. Thanks, Matt. Talk to you soon. That's it. We've once again reached the end of an episode. I just really appreciate you all spending the time. If you like what you heard, don't forget to subscribe to the podcast. And until next week with a fresh new episode.